Advanced Psychoproctology for Beginners, A-Hole Diagnosis, Treatment, and Prevention, with Dr. Jeremy Sherman. Welcome to Class 3 of our Advanced Psychoproctology course for beginners, a course in which we dig deep into two questions, what distinguishes a-holes, and how do you stop them without becoming one? Here, let me remind you where you first met the psychoproctologist's questions. Chances are it was when parents or teachers told you the formula for dealing with bullies. If your experience was anything like mine, you heard advice given with confidence, as though there were a clear solution. Was it always walk away and the bullies will give up on you? Was it fight back until they slink off? Those two are opposites. Was it make friends with them, either to bring them around to your side or to motivate them to invite you to join them? In other words, fight them, escape them, or accommodate them. Those are the basic options whenever you're trapped in an uncomfortable situation. There's three-way opposites. Accept and try to change something are the opposites, covered by the serenity prayer, and exiting is the opposite of either. Each of these three can work or fail. There isn't a surefire formula. If there were, you wouldn't need the quest for the wisdom to know when to do which. If you were bullied at school, you might have heard that the solution was to report to higher-ups. Institutions can redirect bullies to safety monitors who will treat the bullying as rule-breaking or to school psychologists who will treat the bullying as a behavioral problem. Now you're an adult out in the big world where you can't always get reliable institutional help. And here we are, still wondering what to do about bullies, though to call them bullies implies that we're bullyable, which the bullies love. So for now, we're calling them a-holes, and like bullies, they'll be quick to say we're the bullies who started it. And maybe we did. It's harder to tell who started it than we notice. That's because of an inescapable ambiguity about weapons, including verbal ones. The same tools that can be used for defense can be used for attack. At the beginning of Hitler's rise, he was building up his forces, but insisted that his offensive weapons were only for defense. Shortly before his death, Hitler said he was only trying to defend Germany against the terror of Judeo-Bolshevism, the Jewish and Soviet threat. It's evident to most people that it wasn't just that. Still, sometimes the self-declared victim of a holery is the victim, and sometimes they're the a-hole. We can't rule out the possibility that we're the a-holes, which is the reason we have to get beyond assuming that a butthead is just anyone with whom we butt heads. Again, if there's anything I hope you'll take away from this course, it's this question about how to distinguish a-holes most objectively. Wrestling with that question is how we can start to maintain an adaptive society in which diversity and freedom reigns, but we still rein in the real a-holes. To start to address that question today, we're going to engage in a process of elimination, working through the many ways that people think they can distinguish a-holes that don't really work. We'll address what's declared in the butthead question, the common notion that a-holes are people who butt heads and disagree with us. But we'll also get to other common misconceptions about what distinguishes a-holes. For an overview, here's a list of the standards we'll examine and eliminate one by one. I'll make the case that we can't distinguish a-holes by their causes, their rhetorical style, their personal histories, their motivations, or their demographics. Nor can we distinguish them by their power, their consequences, the range of their aholery, their exploitation of cheap rhetorical tricks, or how they make us feel. I'll try to make clear why each of these criteria doesn't work. First, can we distinguish aholes by their missions, their causes, what they claim to be fighting for? Well, there are a-holes and non-a-holes in support of any cause you can imagine. Some folks think religious people are all a-holes, and some folks think that all atheists are. Neither is the case. Some people believe all conservatives are a-holes, and some people think that all liberals are. Neither is the case. Not all believers in this or that are a-holes, and a-holes aren't confined to one belief. You don't even need to have a belief, cause, or doctrine to be an a-hole. I'm going to end up making the case that a-holes don't really have beliefs or values, despite how much they insist that they do. I'll argue that an a-hole's belief is a contradiction in terms. For a-holes, beliefs and values are subterfuge, lip service, smoke screens, weapons and armor for moralizing to shame others, and nothing more. 
By the time we get around to how to stop them, this will be clearer. It will also become clear why, to stop them, you're going to have to ignore their declared ideas. An a-hole isn't just anyone who opposes our views. To claim that they are is fake objectivity, as if you're the last word on what's right. That if it's wrong for you, it's universally and objectively wrong. For that reason, we can't even accurately describe a-holes as extremists. Extreme is a relative term. To say that someone is an extremist implies that they are far from some established center. Is there an established center? By the standards people held in the Middle Ages, we're all extremists because we live so differently from how they did. The term extremist is like the terms optimist or pessimist, though they sound like labels we can assign objectively, as though calling a spade a spade, they're highly subjective. A pessimist is just someone who thinks things a pessimist is just someone who thinks things will turn out worse than you think they will. Likewise, an extremist is someone who diverges from your subjective standard. We'll have to do better than that, since in this world of wildly divergent standards, everyone's an extremist to someone. As mentioned in Class 1, I'll be using the term cult as the plural for a-hole, as in gaggles of geese and cults of a-holes. And I'll say this too as clarification about how I use terms. There is no official definition for a term like a-hole or cult, and I'm not claiming one. I can define terms how I want, and people are free to say, that's not what the word means to me. I can work with anyone's definition of anything, but to say that's not what the word means would be fake objectivity. What I can't do is be inconsistent in my use of a definition, changing my definition midstream to suit my purposes. That's called equivocation. Equivocation is talking out both sides of our mouths. It's a way I could draw a hard line that I then move around to suit me so that I always get the last word. That's a common rhetorical trick. We all use it, but a-holes use it absolutely. I call it fluid hardlining. You draw a hard line, for example, between a-holes and non-a-holes, and then you move it around fluidly to serve your changing needs. By the definition I developed for this course, a-holes exploit a lot of fluid hardlining. For example, an a-hole might say that they're absolutely for everyone's freedom, but when they infringe on yours, they'll say that's not a violation of freedom because suddenly freedom means something different to them. We'll end up spending all of class six on fluid hardlining. In the first class, I described a-holes as infallibilists, posturing as though they live by last word principles that grant them last word authority. Since they don't live by these principles, they handle it by fluid hardlining, claiming to live by whatever principle serves them at the moment. It's like claiming to be on a strict diet that includes all of the diets. Since there's a diet that encourages eating anything from bacon to bread, just cite whatever diet encourages you to eat whatever you want to eat in the moment. One can be an omnivore on all diets by applying each diet selectively to suit one's desires. When I say I'll be using the term cult as the plural for a-holes, or when we come to a definition of a-hole and a more descriptive name for it, they will be my names and definitions, and you're free to come up with your own. Still, my goal here is to remain consistent with my definitions, and I'm declaring that I'll use cult as the plural for a-hole. Now, some researchers describe cult members as true believers. That's their definition. Still, I have my doubts about true as the right word to describe all cult members' beliefs. The cultists will insist that their faith is true, but do we have to take their word for it? How can we tell whether someone's beliefs are true? Here, to keep things grounded and practical, I'll say that someone's beliefs are true beliefs if they try to act on them. It's not enough to give our beliefs passionate lip service. A true belief is one that's practiced, not just preached. So are a-holes or cult members true believers? They sure act like they want us to think that their beliefs are true, that their utmost concern is whatever cause they're crusading for, and that their cause matters to them so much that it trumps all other considerations. But the question is, do they act on their beliefs? If they don't practice what they preach, instead engaging in a lot of hypocrisy, as a-holes do, it's not accurate to describe them as true believers. There are some true believers who try to practice what they preach and walk their talk, but there are also fake believers, people who don't practice what they preach or walk their talk. Fake believers are of two kinds. There are honest and dishonest fake believers. Honest fake believers admit that they don't practice what they preach. For example, I have friends in mainland China who have told me that, of course, they're communists. 
not that it made any difference to how they behaved or what they thought. China still calls itself communist. So sure, my friends salute the Marxist flag and wear the communist team jersey. They love their communist community, but no, they don't believe that stuff. And they don't think they deserve special treatment because they happen to be on the communist team. Humans have a tribal streak, and it's good to have a safe outlet for it. I admire honest fake believers. I think it's an effective way to vent the tribal impulses that can otherwise turn someone into a cultist. In contrast, dishonest fake believers are the ones I think are most prone to a holery. They don't practice what they preach or walk their talk. They are not true believers, nor are they honest about their fake beliefs. Instead, they wear their tribal jersey as a badge of authority. They assume that their lip service beliefs entitle them to the last word. And it can be any jersey for any cause. That's the point. You can't tell a crook by their cover story about why they deserve the authoritative last word. Psychoproctology is fundamentally nonpartisan. It doesn't care what mission an a-hole claims to embrace, and it can often side with an a-hole in agreeing that their opponents are a-holes. A psychoproctologist is contented to agree with right-wing libertarian a-holes like Anne Ran in diagnosing Stalinists as a-holes, and vice versa. It's not what they pretend to stand for. It's how they strut it as the last word. Moving on down the list, can you tell who's an a-hole by their intensity or rhetorical style? Are the a-holes the ones who bark, cry, and shriek the loudest? That's a popular notion among those who claim calm, rational civility as their top moral priority. People who claim that if everyone would just adhere to those civilized standards, no one would be an a-hole. But think about it. Suppose you've got a dictator, inaccessible to the citizens who he treats with unspeakable cruelty. If you were one of those citizens who, for example, had just lost your family as casualties in the dictator's massacre, you'd be pretty passionate and intense about it, and the dictator could stay calm above the fray. Would that make you the a-hole? Are all a-holes aggressive, loud, and brassy? That's a popular notion among people who have a milder style. Still, it doesn't hold up. People are creative, and one of our greatest outlets for creativity is finding ways to say nope. Our noping strategies are diverse. We can say nope as loud as a foghorn, but we can also say it with the subtlest eye twitch or sigh. There are plenty of a-holes who posture like priests or pedants, talking down to all challengers in measured tones, posing as the authorities on proper behavior, and acting like their ability to make a calm, logical argument proves that they get the last word. There are also plenty that pout, playing victim, forced to suffer fools. A-holes come in many rhetorical flavors. Assuming that intensity proves someone is the real a-hole leads to two problems. First, a calm a-hole can always dismiss you as not worth listening to because you're upset and therefore an a-hole. Second, many people would rather not bother figuring out who's at fault. They'll blame anyone who's fighting, regardless of whether they're fighting for their lives or fighting to maintain absolute a-hole power. There were Nazi sympathizers who were eager to help the Nazi cause. But there were also Nazi empathizers who just didn't like the commotion and thought it was very uncivil of Hitler's resistance to become so agitated. A-holes want the last word, and they'll proclaim it no matter how people respond to them. That's bound to frustrate a lot of people. It gives an a-hole an easy way to claim the last word. Oh, look, you're upset. I hurt your feelings. You must not be acting rationally. I won. I get the last word. So no, you can't tell who's an a-hole by who's most emotionally intense. Sure, intense feelings can make someone an a-hole, but dealing with an a-hole can also stir intense emotions. Moving on, can you tell who's an a-hole by their biographies? Did all a-holes have tortured childhoods? Or the reverse, were all a-holes pampered? Not really. Some males have a history of trauma, some have a screw loose, some were pampered, some were tortured, some come from dysfunctional families, some come from functional healthy families, some grew up in a culture undergoing a cult epidemic so they didn't know better, some broke with their cultures and became a-holes. Some never grew up, some grew up and then regressed, some are highly educated, and some are education deprived. Some are paid irresistible amounts of money to be a-holes, some are so desperately poor they have no choice but to join their local a-hole cult. Some have a chip on their shoulder, some are so full of themselves that they think that their dogma poop is gold. 
Some are born a-holes, some choose to become a-holes, and some have a-holery thrust upon them. There are many biographical paths to becoming an a-hole. Some routes evoke pity, and some evoke disgust. None of these biographical markings distinguish a-holes. It takes all kinds, and all kinds can take a detour down into the habits of a-holery. Can you tell who's an a-hole by their motivations? A-hole motivations are diverse, something nothing but highly of themselves. Some are compensating for a chip on their shoulders the size of a bowling ball. Some are naive followers, and some are cunning con artist leaders. Some fall backwards into the addictive habit of last word insistence and just can't, won't, and think they shouldn't drag themselves out of it. Besides, as any social science researcher can tell you, motivations aren't objectively accessible. After all, how can you tell what motivates someone? By asking them? There's motivated self-reporting bias, the way when asked what motivates us, we say what sounds good. There's also unmotivated self-reporting bias, though we might want to claim that we know ourselves through and through, we can't. About that, Freud was right. There's a whole lot more going on under the hood of any of us humans than we know or can ever know. Furthermore, none of us ever do anything for just one reason. We have a molten slurry of motives for our behavior and we're all just guessing what motivates us. Even the most honest, probing introspector can't be aware of everything that motivates them. When someone says, don't tell me how I feel, they're right. We're not authorities on what other people feel, but then neither are they. You've known people who honestly claim to have motivations that you doubted were their real motivations. For example, claiming they were angry and outraged when you sense that they were sad or scared. If such self-unawareness is possible, what could ever make anyone exempt from it? Certainly not the claim that, no, really, you know how you feel. Anyone can claim that. Not being able to objectively identify an a-hole's motives makes it difficult to know how to stop them. For example, it can be counterproductive to treat a naive a-hole, just going along with the crowd, as though they have a con artist's motivation. You'll be unduly harsh with them. Conversely, it can be counterproductive to treat a con artist as though they have a naive a-hole's motivations. You'll go too easy on them. A-holes often play a shell game to keep you guessing about their motivations. As part of their campaign to get the last word, they'll tell you that you just don't understand them. They'll pretend to be things they aren't in an identity shell game to keep you guessing. One moment they'll talk like you should be nicer because they're trying to change. Next moment they'll scold you for being biased against them because they've already changed. Next moment they'll tell you that they shouldn't have to change. Can't change, have changed, shouldn't change. They'll scorn you for failing to understand their true motives as they shift how they present motivations they don't know anyway. They'll alternate between these options to keep you guessing, or they'll throw them at you all at once. Leave me the hell alone. I'm trying to change, and I've already succeeded in changing, and besides, why should I have to change? There will be a huge strategic advantage to know the true motivations of each a-hole we try to stop. We can't. Their motives are diverse and not completely knowable. Okay, so can you tell an a-hole by their demographics? For example, their gender, class, or race? No, anyone from any demographic can become an a-hole. It's a human thing. A-holes may be more prevalent in a dominant demographic, the rich in plutocracies, whites in a white-dominant culture, men in a male-dominant culture, since they can get away with it more. Still, subordinated subcultures can end up with a-hole epidemics too. The oppressed often do. That's how we get the endless changing of the scarred, yesterday's have-nots, taking their turn becoming the next a-holes when they become the haves. Once victimized a-holes often play victim long after they're in power. There's a notion out there that a-holes are people who believe that might makes right. A-holes do when they're mighty. But when they're not mighty, they'll argue that might makes wrong and that they're the wronged, oppressed minority. Whether they claim that they're heroic victims or heroic victors doesn't really matter to them so long as they can continue to think of themselves as last word heroic. And should they ever become oppressed minorities again, they'd switch right back to playing heroic victims, much like the tyrannical spouse who once dumped pouts about their victimhood. So let's talk about power next. Does power determine who's an a-hole and who isn't? Not really. There are benevolent and malevolent dictators and billionaires. You may not like some dictator, 
But some nations have thrived under dictators, while other nations have perished. Having power can be unfair, but not all people in power are a-holes. Can you tell a-holes by their consequences? Are total a-holes those who make bad things happen? While they do, they aren't the only ones. Bad things happen in lots of ways. Anyone in power has a lot more to juggle and therefore more potential for juggling it badly with catastrophic consequences. But not all error proves someone an a-hole. Life is iffy. Often unconsciously, we demand that our leaders act as though they have the perfect formula. After all, the more leverage you get, the more you would want a perfect formula for exercising it. But that's the reverse of reality. The more leverage you get, the harder it is to know how things will go. The future is uncertain for all of us, and especially when wielding lots of power. You can bet right with things turning out wrong. A minor error made by a minor actor is likely to be of less consequence than a minor error made by a major actor. That a person with immense power makes big mistakes can't be how we distinguish a-holes. Besides, we need to guess who's an a-hole in advance of outcomes. Sure, someone with a lousy track record is probably a bad bet for leadership, but even that doesn't necessarily mean that they're an a-hole. How about their range? For example, are a-holes know-it-alls about everything always? Not necessarily. Few people claim authority about absolutely everything. Most a-holes are hobbyists specializing in claiming the last word with some people in some contexts or on some topics. A-hole trolls are often civilized company by day. They just moonlight as trolls on their know-it-all topic, politics or religion, for example. Still, they can be normal, decent, okay people otherwise, perfectly capable of give and take in their family relationships or at work. There are some full-time 360-degree, 24-7 a-holes. Trump, for example. But not all a-holes are wall-to-wall like that. Can you tell who's an a-hole by their use of empty rhetoric? First, a word about empty rhetoric. Rhetoric originally meant the art of speaking, but today it mostly means spin, the art of persuading people to believe what you want them to believe. Rhetoric is inherently empty in three senses. It's empty because it has no bearing on what's true. It's empty because it's lightweight, easy to wield in debate, and it's empty because it's generic, devoid of allegiances. The same rhetoric can be applied to opposite interpretations. Think of empty rhetoric like an army of well-armed mercenaries you can hire on the cheap. Their influence is weighty, but their allegiance is hollow, lightweight, as should be their influence on outcomes of a debate. Empty rhetoric weighs in on any side of any debate. Or think of it as anyone's thumb on the scale, distorting the true weight of an argument. Everyone has a thumb. Anyone can distort an argument, making it sound more persuasive than is justified. Empty rhetoric is, in effect, a power grab. An example might help. Take the slogan, Make America Great Again, as an argument in support of Trump. Well, what does it mean? At most, that we need to restore good features of past U.S. history. Which features? It could be any. Giving the country back to Native Americans? Reviving slavery? Reviving the New Deal? Whatever. The rhetoric is generic. It's also universal. There's not an American who wouldn't want to make America better and can think of some past quality of America that they would like to restore. If you decoupled the term from Trump's use of it and held a referendum on whether to make America great again, it would win unanimous support and mean nothing. Claiming that it means anything Trumpian is like claiming that the slogan, bring back the best of the past, is an argument for anything you happen to want to bring back. As such, it's empty rhetoric. There are lots of rhetorical tropes, devices, or power grab moves we can use that way. A lot of them are listed as informal fallacies. An informal fallacy is an irrelevant reason used in an argument for something. The something in question might be right or wrong, but the point with fallacies is that we tend to give these red herring reasons more weight than they deserve. They're non-reasons that we tend to mistake for reasons. For example, suppose I claim that breathing is good for your health because it's popular. Well, lots of things are popular that aren't good for your health. Corn syrup, for example. To say that something is good for your health because it's popular is bogus, lame, fake, lightweight, a red herring, or what I'd call an undicator in that it doesn't indicate one way or another about whether the argument is right. Popularity is not a relevant reason why breathing is good for your health, even though it is. 
Lots of people get this wrong about fallacies. Just because a reason for something is a fallacy, in this case, the ad populum fallacy, the argument that something must be right because lots of people do it, that something may still be right. Everything is right, but not because everyone does it. Empty rhetoric is not limited to word tricks. Gestures can serve as sell job thumbs on the scale, too. Take a sigh of disappointment when someone delivers bad yet realistic news. That sigh has no bearing on whether the news is true, and anyway, anyone can sigh. It's a generic mercenary thumb on the scale, a hollow yet often quite effective way of getting people to spare your feelings. We all use empty rhetoric. It's the likable story prevailing over the likely one when we can get away with expressing our biases. It would be simpler if only a-holes used empty rhetoric. But since we all use it, we can't claim that anyone who uses empty rhetoric is an a-hole. Here's another standard for identifying a-holes. It's kind of the obverse of empty rhetoric. A-holes are people who don't use critical thinking and logic. Critical thinking and logic are the flip sides of empty rhetoric. If empty rhetoric is our repertoire of ways to spin the truth in ways we like, then critical thinking is our repertoire of ways to unspin the spin, to in effect strip thumbs off the scale. Empty rhetoric is the spin doctor's bag of cheap tricks. Logic or critical thinking are the antidotes to the spin doctor's bag of cheap tricks. So if someone uses logic, they can't be an a-hole, right? Not really. A-holes can make very subtle, complex, logical arguments for why they get the last word and why everyone is wrong to challenge them. Like the dictator mentioned above, who calmly dismisses the emotional outcry of the people he oppresses, a logician can be an a-hole. Contrary to popular belief, logical and critical thinking don't prevent someone from becoming an a-hole, nor is it the antidote to all a-holery. This has to do with something we'll be getting to in more depth in our next session. Logic is not some formula by which you can just crunch the facts and arrive at absolutely true conclusions. Like math, it's actually just a syntax for maintaining consistency. If you start with garbage assumptions and run it through a logic mill, you'll end up with garbage conclusions. Take this example of deduction, the gold standard in logic. All South Americans are a-holes. Juan is South American, therefore Juan is an a-hole. The logic is airtight, but garbage in, garbage out. Start with a bogus premise, like that all South Americans are a-holes, and you'll be deducing garbage conclusions. No one lives on logic alone, and even if they did, they could still be a-holes. Alas, the use of critical thinking or logic cannot help us determine who is or isn't an a-hole. I want to touch on one last standard. Probably the most famous psychoproctologist these days is a Stanford organizational psychology professor named Robert L. Sutton, author of such books as The No Asshole Rule. I'm grateful to him for having opened the way for rigorous research into a-holes. Now, he has two standards for determining whether you're dealing with an a-hole. One, after encountering the person, do you feel oppressed, humiliated, or otherwise worse about yourself? Two, does the person target people who are less powerful than him or her? Much as I respect Sutton's curiosity, I don't think these standards work. If we use that first as a standard, what's to stop an a-hole from playing victim, claiming to feel oppressed, humiliated, and otherwise worse about themselves whenever we challenge them? To apply this standard would be another case of fake objectivity. Pretending we're the measure of all things, the gold standard, neutral last word on right and wrong. So if someone hurts our feelings, they're an a-hole. Anytime two people argue, they're both at risk of feeling oppressed, humiliated, or otherwise worse about themselves. But that doesn't mean that either or both are a-holes. I don't know about you, but in a way I do because I'm a fellow human. It's not like I can be cheerful when someone tells me that the work I think is far along needs a lot more work. It's inherently disappointing. I can feel humiliated or otherwise worse about myself. It's a bit like a general contractor telling me my house foundation needs a big, expensive, unexpected repair job, or like the dentist telling me I need a costly root canal. My gut can't just welcome such news. So though I try to stay receptive, it's not as though I can't feel humiliated when told my work is bad. Okay, so if I happen to feel oppressed, humiliated, or otherwise worse about myself, does that make the messenger of the bad news an a-hole? Hardly. The messenger might be right or wrong about my work, but I don't get to indulge in pretending they're a-holes because they give me disappointing news. 
As for Sutton's second criteria, nope, again. Think about the disappointed, disadvantaged person who turns to a-holery to rail against people in power. There are powerful and powerless a-holes. Many Trump supporters have become a-holes out of frustration with their lack of power. Okay, if we can't tell an a-hole by their cause, passion, life history, motivations, flavor, demographics, power, consequences, breadth, use of empty rhetoric, failure to use logic, the way they make us feel, or their dominance over subordinates, what's left? What makes someone an a-hole, since none of these standards work? Our next session will draw upon scientific practices to suggest an overlooked option for how to begin to distinguish a-holes. Thank you.